I'm pleased to introduce our last speaker for today, Aaron Nagel from Northwestern University. He got his PhD from Princeton University in 2009. His thesis advice was current here. And he's, uh, this year he's a Sloan Fellow, and until last year he was uh, he had an um, NSF postdoctoral fellowship for four years. And now he is in Northwestern University. And he has been working on Linkovitcher flow, and H flow, harmonic maps, and uniform Reifenberg species. And today he will talk about the geometry of beach curvature. Let's welcome him. To begin with, I'd like to certainly thank the IMU for the invitation and the opportunity to talk here today. Um, I think maybe I'll mention first that typically I, I give chalkboard talks and my ability to think is tied in with my ability to walk. So uh, we'll, we'll all have to see how this goes. Uh, so I'll, I'll be discussing today uh, recent progress, uh, say over the last four years or so, in, in the area of beachy curvature. And in particular, on top of that, say new directions and conjectures and open questions about what's supposed to come next now. So the general outline of my talk is as follows. We'll start with some basic background. And after that, we'll spend a few minutes talking about lower Ricci curvature and the structure of such spaces. We'll sort of state a little bit of background and what the newer results are in that area and what should come next. And similarly, we'll with uh, the regularity of spaces with bounded curvature. And then we'll end the talk a little bit in something that's kind of different and we'll sort of try to talk about new ways of understanding what it means for a space to have bounds on Ricci curvature. These sorts of ideas are becoming more prevalent nowadays. So to start with, let's just sort of center on something. So we'll be focusing on Riemannian manifolds, and typically they'll be pointed, which just means I'm going to fix a point x inside of them. It's just convenient. And no one probably needs me to tell them this. The curvature, we'll call it, is just the anti-symmetric part of the Hessian of a vector field, right? But more importantly, if you're looking for intuition, you should be interpreting this as the Hessian of the metric itself. So, so it, it, behave, it behaves much the way the Hessian of a function does. So when you have bounds on it, this is sort of why you expect analysts to really like this condition. And, and when you go this way, the point is that the Ricci curvature, which is now the trace of, of the Riemann curvature tensor, then becomes, can be interpreted as the Laplacian of the metric. Or if you want to be really picky, it should be interpreted as minus two times the Laplacian of the metric. But nonetheless, this should give some feel as to why it's an important thing and why it appears all over the place. Uh, and the last little piece of notational nonsense I'll throw at you is that we, what typically the measure will associate to the manifold won't be the volume measure, it'll be very close, and it'll be the volume measure times a constant, this constant being uh, 1 over the volume of the ball of radius 1 around our base point. Uh, in the context where we're sending sequences and, and that this volume is going to zero, that this will be important, otherwise we won't care. Uh, on the topic of sequences, even if we're only considering or care about like one manifold, it's just sort of inevitable that you have to study sequences of spaces. And when you start studying sequences of spaces, uh, the natural thing you want to do is take limits of these things and know what those things look like. And to take limits, we have to know what we mean by a limit. And by a limit, I mean in the measured form of Hausdorff topology. So it's a way of taking a sequence of metric measure spaces and getting a new metric measure space. And I'm not going to define it for you, I'm just going to say it's a really awful notion of convergence. Um, but the reason it's important and it plays a role is this wonderful theorem of Gromov going back to the 80s. It just basically says that if we have a sequence of Riemannian manifolds with a lower Ricci bound, then in fact, at least after passing to a subsequence, they will converge to a metric space. So this is a reasonable notion of convergence uh, when we're dealing with Ricci curvature. We have a compactness statement. And uh, other people, Fukai and others, basically said, okay, well, the measure actually converges too. And this is sort of important for technical reasons. Uh, but basically, th this initiates the study of Ricci limit spaces, metric spaces which arise limits uh, of Riemannian manifolds with lower Ricci bounds. And it certainly, it poses a very reasonable question, which is simply, what do such metric spaces look like? I mean, what this theorem basically says is that it is a metric space, that's good, um, but we should expect it to be much better than a typical metric space. What sort of structure do these things have? And this has sort of been a, a big open question for a long time, and still is, really. But the, the first really good theorem in this direction uh, was sort of in the mid-90s by Cheater and Holding. And let's just sort of start by uh, uh, reviewing a, a little bit one of their main accomplishments. So, so their, their main accomplishment in, in words was the following. Uh, 
They proved if you considered such a, a metric space, something that arose as a limit, a space of the lower Ricci bounds, then almost every point is infinitesimally Euclidean. So, so slightly more precise, because the, the, the tangent cones of these points are, are, are unique and, and isometric to some Euclidean space. So, so uh, if you don't know what these words mean, it just means when you zoom up very closely, it looks a lot like Euclidean space, which is a very reasonable thing. And it's obviously a much stronger statement than an arbitrary metric space. Um, <clears throat> now, one sort of issue with what's being sort of said here is, is that this Euclidean space, as it's sort of being written, uh, can really depend on what point you're looking at, the, the, the way it's written. So if I, in particular, I could have sort of two different parts of my metric space that maybe look like they're of different dimensions. Or, or even worse, because this is a measure theoretic thing, they, they could be tied together in all kinds of nonsensical ways. And, and the feeling at the time was that this shouldn't be the case, and, and they, I mean, they, they conjectured that their constant curvature, uh, constant uh, dimension conjecture was basically that this doesn't happen. So, so that it should be the case that, that there's some unique integer k, so that for almost every point, the tangent cone is this unique k. I mean, once you have this note, that, that limit spaces actually have to have a unique dimension. So, so we can actually assign a dimension to limit spaces. And in fact, it's not hard to show that, 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 that they're actually rectifiable once you know this. Um, sort of, a, I mean, we'll focus on, on that for a few minutes, but now I'll just sort of throw out that there's sort of a related conjecture that doesn't sound like it has anything to do with this, but it is actually very closely tied. And that is the fact that the isometry group uh, of such a limit space is supposed to be a lead group. So, so, I mean, isometry groups should not be really awfully behaved either. And these two questions, are they look kind of independent and turn out to have some connection to each other. So anyway, um, uh, Toby and I solved this, I guess, uh, a few years back. And if you sort of want to understand well, what are the ideas necessary uh, don't read that theorem. It's a technical mess. I'll tell you what it's saying. Um, if, if you want to understand how you show such a thing, the, the key point is you really want to understand uh, the geometry of geodesics uh, on your space. And in particular, what, what this theorem says in a very nice, precise way is that if you take a minimizing geodesic uh, on uh, a metric space, which arises as, a, say, a limit of uh, space with lower Ricci bounds, then the, the, the geometry along the interior of this geodesic, it can't change quickly. It actually has to change at a continuous rate. So, so slightly more precisely, if we take two points and we, we look at like two balls around those points, and these points are on the interior of a minimizing geodesic, those balls must be blown off house with close to each other. They can't actually move that quickly in, in geometry as you're moving along. And, and I mean, the, the way this is set up, you, you can actually push this a tad bit further and say that basically by letting r go to zero in this picture, what you're really saying then is that tangent cones along the interior of a minimizing geodesic have to change continuously. They can't jump as you're moving along it. Okay, so it sounds like a technical statement, but basically I, I more or less my technical nonsense claim that you know, the, the proof of these conjectures is done once you know this. And why is that true? So this is something that we can't actually explain on one slide. So to try to understand and get some feel for this, level, let's start with a precise statement. So, so the statement is that you look at a metric measure space, it arises as a, a limit of Riemannian manifolds with lower Ricci bounds. Then the idea is that there's some unique integer k and a subset of full measure, uh, such that the tangent cone at each of these points is unique and isometric to rk. So but we have a unique dimension now. And so what we're going to do is we're going to prove this through picture. We're going to prove it through an example. So instead of proving a, some sort of general statement here, uh, let's just consider one nice, easy example of this. The resolution of that was so much better on my computer. Uh, so, so consider the following example, a trumpet space. Really simple thing. So, so the point is it's got one component off to the, uh, off to the well, I guess it's the right now, um, off to the right, which, which is, uh, you're facing it left there. So off to the left, which is one dimensional. Right, another component is two-dimensional off to the right there. And we want to see that this thing can't arise as a limit of spaces with lower reaching bounds. So why? So pick your two favorite points, one of which being somewhere in the middle of the one-dimensional piece and the other one being somewhere in the middle of the two-dimensional piece. Mark those things by x's. And let's just connect them by our favorite minimizing geodesic. So, so uh, that little line in the middle is supposed to be the geodesic connecting these two guys. So well, what's special uh, about this geodesic now? So, Let's just, I mean, let's look at the tangent cones uh, along these ge this geodesic, so the, the, the infinitesimal behavior. So the point is that there's this distinguished point kind of roughly in the middle of your geodesic, right, where to the left, I mean, everything looks like R, right? I mean, the, the tangent cones are R. And to the right, it looks like R squared, because now we're lying in the middle of our two-dimensional piece. 
And in particular, what that means is there's this point where, where as you approach from one direction, all the tangent cones are all r, and you approach from the other direction, all the tangent cones are all squared, but this is not continuous. And, and that, that's it, that, that's your contradiction. So, so the point is you, you can't have the, the jumping and the tangent cones, and, and thus this thing uh, can't have arisen as a limit of space at a lower reaching bounds just because geometry jumped along the ESS. Okay, all right. So I'm not going to spend like uh, oh, oh so much time on it, but let's just sort of mention that there, there's sort of a, uh, a few other points this is sort of useful for, and I'm just going to say so without really giving much feel for it. So first off is that this regular set is, well, I mean, it exists for one, but so that was the last bit, but it doesn't just exist, it's actually convex, or at least weakly convex, which is to say you, you can't connect any two points by minimizing geodesic still in it, but for every epsilon you can get a curve strictly inside of it whose length is within epsilon of the distance. So in particular, it's connected. So this, this is a topological restriction now on the, the, the set. And this turns out for reasons that uh, let's not bother with. This is sort of meant for people who read this on the web page later. Uh, um, it would be sort of the key point in proving that the isometry group is a leap. I mean, you really need this connectedness and this convexity to actually sort of deal with this issue. OK, so fine. So, so, so this is sort of where, where the general structure of these sort of spaces of lower reach you live. So, so, uh, let, let's just sort of spend a minute and, and sort of think about what we don't know. So what we, we've assigned now to, to every such metric space that arises as a limit, a dimension, right? right? So, this is, so we have this regular set, which is k-rectifiable, and k is our dimension. We haven't said that this dimension has anything to do with other natural notions of dimension. So in, in particular, is the dimension as this thing is defined, is it the same as the Hausdorff dimension? This is an extremely reasonable question if you're looking in the area. Um, basically, the, the reason this is not known, so the regular set, it, I mean, it's k-rectifiable, it's definitely how house how, how dimension k. It's actually the singular set, the, the set which has new measure zero. It's got measure zero, but not necessarily house measure zero. And, and we don't know what the dimension of that thing is. I mean, it shouldn't be bigger than k, but uh, bigger than the dimension of x, but you know, got to prove it. So, so the, this dimension, it should coincide with the uh, house dimension. I think this would be a good problem for somebody. Um, Probably more generally than that, we could ask the singular set not just to have, you know, Hausdorff dimension at most, uh, the dimension of x, but it should actually be less, I mean, say at least one less than the Hausdorff dimension. But this is a harder problem, so that this is strictly harder than the one above it. And in terms of more general structure uh, of these metric spaces, uh, what you'd really like to say is the following. So we've got this k-rectifiable sort of subset, but what about more topological information? So for instance, is there an open dense subset of X which is homeomorphic to a manifold? Um, this, this seems very reasonable. It's known for, for non collapse limits, in fact, so when the volume of this ball of radius 1 of your, your center points doesn't go to 0, but it's not known in general. Um, it would be, uh, uh, this is a hard problem. Um, and slightly more general on that even would be to ask it not to be homeomorphic, but by Lipschitz to a manifold. I'm actually not even convinced this is true. Um, probably part of the reason why the, the, the third one is so tough is the fact that I'm not convinced the fourth one's true. But nonetheless, it, it's a good question. Um, prove it or visit it. Okay, fine. So, so here's our little spiel on, on lower reach curvature. So by the way, I'm going to change topics three times in the, in the course of uh, this talk. And if I lose you at some point during one of them, you have an opportunity to start over when I switch topics. Well, one such opportunity it is now. So uh, I'm going to move from, from lower Ricci curvature to, to, to bounded Ricci curvature. So uh, the, the first reasonable thing to do here is sort of say what, what the, the first real results were. And in fact, this was sort of stated in Picard's talk yesterday as, as well. But the first real results for, for limits of Einstein manifolds, or our limits of spaces with bounded Ricci curvature, they, they were in dimension four. Um, and, and what they said was the following, and that if we looked at the sequence of four manifolds, but with everything bounded here. So this is to say the diameter is bounded, the Ricci is bounded, the volume is bounded from below, and the topology is bounded. And then the limit space has to be a Riemannian orbifold with isolated singularities. And this is actually very nice. So compared to the way this was stated in Bacar's talk yesterday, the point is that this, this topological assumption here uh, is equivalent to an L2 bound on the curvature, as it turns out. But this is the key point, and this is actually, in some sense, why they were able to prove this way before most of the structure theory sort of arises, because you get the cell bound on curvature and just lets you do a lot of things much more easily. So uh, around this time period, there were sort of two conjectures that, that sort of popped up basically from the series of works that, that sort of led to this theorem. Um, one of which was uh, in sort of general dimensions, which basically said that 
in higher dimensions, we want something like this to be true too. So, so that is to say, we, we want the, 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 the regular set to, at least, I mean, the singular set here, I mean, it's isolated singularities, right? So that basically, it means co-dimension four is what it means. And what you want is, at least in general, you would like it if in higher dimensions this was still true. So if you looked at a limit space of manifolds with lower volume and bounded reaches, uh, then it should actually be a Riemannian manifold away from a set of co-dimension four. One should be careful about the structure of a singular set in this case. It's not so simple as being orbifold, um, but we'll maybe talk more about that later. But in any case, it should at least be co-dimension four. Um, the, the other sort of conjecture that appeared around this time was, was sort of related to the, the first theorem. So the first theorem let Anderson prove a really nice uh, result. And he proved that uh, basically under these assumptions, if you look at the collection of Humani manifolds with bounded diameter, Ricci, volume, and topology, then there's a finite diffeomorphism statement. So, so th those conditions actually control the diffeomorphism um, uh, of the space. But, but his basic conjecture, uh, which was actually at his 94 ICM talk, um, was that uh, the, the, the topology bound should not be necessary. Uh, one should not really legitimately need this. Um, so, so, uh, so I guess what we'll do now is, so, uh, so, Chigar and I approved these two conjectures probably in the, the last two months, I guess, we, we just put it out. Um, so, so we'll maybe talk a minute uh, about those. And actually, so more generally, we'll see if we can drop almost all the assumptions in uh, the first there, namely the diameter bound and the, the topology bound is not necessary for that either. Uh, but we'll sort of maybe get to that in a moment. So, so how do you prove this? How, how do you prove that a that, that, uh, limit space has to be smoothed away from a set of co-dimension four? So the key is, in fact, just to rule out co-dimension two singularities. So this is almost, almost uh, again, it sounds like almost an example, but it turns out to be more than that. So, so for instance, let's just consider the following space. Consider what you would call a cone space. So, so uh, consider the, the, the metric space, which is just um, Rn minus 2, some Euclidean factor, cross an ice cream cone. Uh, that's what that little guy is, right? So in particular, if the co-dimension 4 conjecture was true, then this cannot arise as a limit of, of, of Einstein manifolds. Well, we would say that the, 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 the Ricci curvature is bound or going to zero or whatever. Um, simply because the singular set of this thing is co-dimension 2. So if the co-dimension conjecture is true, then this thing can't be a limit space. But basically, conversely, the converse is true too. I mean, uh, this is not I mean, completely fair, but by far the hardest of the work in actually proving co-dimension four is to say that can't arise as a limit space. Well, once you know that, the, the rest of it is more mundane, comparatively speaking. So, so how do you do that? So we want to say that if this thing is actually a limit space, or if you just have some Einstein manifold which is close to it, and then this, this coning what you have here is sort of maximal. I mean, you're actually close to Euclidean space. So, I mean, the intuition for this is the following. So, I imagine you just take that, that, that coning, that cone point there, right, where, where it's singular, and smooth it off a little bit, right? You, you get a, not now a more realistic ice cream cone where you've got like a little smooth bottom on it. Now, it, it is in fact, I mean, much more reasonable now to say that can't arise as a limit uh, of uh, manifolds with, 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 say, Ricci at least going to zero, simply because the Ricci curvature, that little curve there, is, I mean, the sectional curvature, even much less the Ricci, is just huge, it's tremendously big. And once this thing becomes smooth, you actually have to converge to a smooth one. So the idea is that you really like this picture if you could smooth off like that. Now, the reason this intuition fails as being a proof is the fact that this is just blown off Hausdorff close to this thing, so it doesn't really see into that, into that uh, uh, singular set. You don't actually know that it looks like you could have all kinds of topology in there that, that's maybe actually giving you some other way to smooth this thing out. And this is the main thing that, 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 that's really a problem. So, so the key idea, which I'm not going to really discuss at all except to throw the name out, is a new slicing theorem. And I'm not going to say at all what this is. I played with it a little bit, and it basically took me 10 minutes to explain it in a way that was sort of reasonable. And I sort of decided I'll just sort of say what you use it for instead. Well, what you use it for is to say the following. And imagine you actually have an Einstein manifold that looks close to this thing, this R minus 2 cross a cone. Then what you can do is basically blow up. So, so you, you can basically find a point and some really small radii so that you rescale your space. And once you do that, it actually does look like this. It looks like the smooth cone. So, so if, the, if the first guy, the R minus 2 cross a cone, arose as a limit space, then you can show that basically after sort of dilation and point picking and picking different sequence, but still things with, with, with Ricci bounds, then so does that. That also has to arise as a limit space. 
And now there's the contradiction, because we sort of just sort of went through why that, that is not a reasonable thing that actually appears a limit space. So, so th this is basically what it is you, you want to do, and, and the proof. <clears throat> okay, so basically throwing this together in a slightly more, more uh, rigorous statement, as opposed to all the formality we're saying. Uh, um, uh, actually, the, the co-dimension three singularities are actually much easier to deal with than the co-dimension two. Uh, the, the main theorem is the following, uh, epsilon irregularity theorem. So this is somehow the, the, the main work. And it basically just says if, if you have an Einstein manifold, and if it looks close on some ball to R n minus three cross a cone space, a likely example from before, just think like that, um, then you actually have to have bounded curvature. You, you've got to be smooth uh, on a ball of half the size. Uh, these sort of epsilon regularity theorems, by the way, are tremendously important in nonlinear PDEs. I mean, you want to say that if you have a solution with a lot of almost symmetry, then it has to be smooth. I mean, that this is a key point in harmonic maps and uh, between Riemannian manifolds and mean curvature flow and minimal surfaces. And this is the standard sort of, I mean, this is how you kind of want to do it. And the reason is that, as ridiculous as a condition as that seems, this R minus 3 cross a cone, it is in all these situations controllable. So, so you can always say that away from some set of small co-dimension, there are always some tangent cone that has that much symmetry. So that in particular, if you use the standard stratification theory, which really just involves lower Ricci curvature, uh, you, you immediately obtain the result. I mean, if you don't know the stratification theory, don't worry about it. Sort of take my word for it that that condition is easy to force. So what you get is just immediately, the, the, as a corollary, you get the co-dimension 4, which is that to say that so away from a set of co-dimension 4, you, you have that there's going to be some ball around that point that looks very close to R minus 3 cross something, which actually means it's smooth. And that's it. That's, that's, the, that's the conjecture. So uh, actually, much nicer than this is, is that instead of sort of combining this with a stratification theory, you, you can combine this with a more effective formula called a quantitative stratification. I mean, these are some ideas that basically Jeff and I introduced about two years ago, actually exactly for this point. Um, we wanted to basically turn these really bad ineffective estimates into uh, you know, LP bounds on curvature. Um, I also sort of want to mention that, again, as sort of weird as this all may look, I mean, this very general technique works in a lot of areas. I mean, we used it for minimizing harmonic maps between Riemannian manifolds and the first sharp LP estimates on, on the second fundamental form of minimizing uh, hypersurfaces. So it's actually a pretty general point. Um, but in this case, what it just basically says is that if we have a manifold with bound to reaching a lower volume, then automatically uh, every ball has, there, there's an LP bound uh, on the curvature. And basically every P less than 2 is what this is saying. So you don't quite have L2 from this on the curvature, but everything less than it that you have. Um, and in particular, you, you get from this not just co-dimension 4, but Minkowski co-dimension 4. So you know, there are various statements that kind of follow from this. <clears throat> okay, so. Okay, so, so this can be improved sort of uh, significantly if, if we were to instead look at not just sort of general manifolds, but we instead look at four manifolds. So, so if we look at four manifolds, then, then the, maybe the, the best place to actually start is to sort of to re-examine the, the, the compactness argument from the beginning. So, by using the co-dimension 4, well, what you can say is the following. Uh, you can say that if you have a sequence of four manifolds uh, with bound to reaching a lower volume, then automatically the, the, uh, the limit space is a Riemannian orbifold with isolated singularities. So, so sort of keep in mind that the important things that are about this theorem, or the important things that aren't there really, is that there's no diameter assumption and there's no topology assumption uh, on the space. And the point is that once you have that, you can basically just use what is a, I mean, a more or less standard sort of type of bubbling and glooming argument to actually arrive at Anderson's conjecture. So that is the fact that under a, a Ricci bound and a volume bound, a diameter bound, a M actually has bound of diffeomorphism type. Uh, I mean, in essence, you kind of just prove this by, by contradiction. And you look at your limit and you get some nice orbital, and you start glooming in by doing a, a blow up and a bubbling. Um, this, this is sort of a, a pretty standard sort of trick once you sort of have the structure. Uh, the key point is just being able to get that Riemannian orbital without more assumptions. Um, and in fact, actually, that this finite diffeomorphism theorem, it's not global. You don't really need the diameter bound. And this, this has a really important application. And in fact, uh, you could just instead look at a space with, with a Ricci bound and a lower bound of volume. You just basically say the ball of radius 1 has a finite diffeomorphism. And the reason this matters is that, so, so sort of classically, how is this topology bound used? It was used to force an L2 bound on the curvature. 
Um, because once you know that, 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 that the topology is bounded, you use gal spin A to get an L2 bound on the curvature. But if you have that for free, what you can use is just you can get the L2 bound on the curvature without anything. So, so in dimension four, you, you can actually say that if you have a Ricci bound and a lower volume bound, then the L2 bound on the curvature is, is bounded itself. And this is sharp, by the way. I mean, you can't do better than two. Uh, this, this, this is pretty clear. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, maybe I'll sort of mention that. So, the, the proof is a little bit more convoluted than uh, I sort of said here. But the way the proof actually goes is that you, you actually first prove in the first theorem that the limit is a topological orbifold. You use that to prove the, uh, the, the diffeomorphism statements. Uh, the second, you use that to prove the L2 bound, and you go back to get the, the actual isometric to an orbifold business, but whatever. <clears throat> so, uh, another sort of nice actually application of this is that if you have a four-dimensional uh, four complete manifold that, that's, uh, uh, whose volume is, is non-collapsed at infinity, it's automatically ALE. Um, so so you, you get some sort of, I mean, usually you have to make other sorts of assumptions even with the L2 bound curvature to do this. <coughs> okay, so with all this said, let, let's, let's again talk about conjectures and, and what's supposed to come next. So, so the first thing is, is that Sort of based on the results I just said, so what do we prove? We proved in all dimensions that for every p less than 2, there's an LP bound on the curvature if you're an Einstein manifold, just for free. And we proved in dimension 4, there's an L2 bound. Well, which naturally leads to the reasonable thought that the L2 bound should hold in all dimensions. Um, so that this would be somehow viewed as being a really improved version of the co dimension 4 conjecture. I mean, this is a much uh, stronger sort of statement. Uh, notice a nice corollary of this would be the fact that automatically your singular set would have to be n minus 4 rectifiable. I mean, I, I won't say why, but it is sort of a, a standard point that once you have this, you can actually get some. I mean, I've said nothing about the singular set so far, right? This is all about the structure of the smooth part of the limit space of Einstein manifolds. And you can at least get rectifiability if you knew this much. Um, however, that being said, I mean, once you can expect much more from the singular set, people know very little about it at the moment. Um, what one should really probably expect here is that if you look at such a limit space uh, with bound to reach your lower volume, then, then the limit space should actually be by Lipschitz to a real analytic variety. So, so this, this, is a, this is kind of a folklore conjecture with which people have been sort of, uh, I think, hesitant to actually put in print with, with their name next to it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to throw it out there because I think it's a very reasonable thing, so prove or disprove it. Um, okay. So, great. So, then, with all of this said, then uh, let's move on to sort of our, our last topic. So, so this is, again, sort of changing topics entirely. For those of you I, I, I've lost, it's just a, a good time. Um, so, the, the last point is sort of the following. So, so I mean, future directions in Ricci curvature, I mean, th this has been all about regularity theory so far. We've been discussing the... the the regularity of, of, of Einstein manifolds, the regularity of their limit spaces. But, but really, I mean, you do all that with a purpose. I mean, you're going to eventually want to use this to do something. And that alone usually involves wanting to know more uh, about what Ricci curvature is, about what Einstein manifolds are. And in particular, what is the meaning uh, of Ricci curvature uh, on a space? And there are really a lot of ways of interpreting what the meaning of Ricci curvature is. I mean, I'll give you quite a few before we're done. But the point is, each new one really leads to new understanding and new things you can do. And in particular, there are many, many ways of doing this for lower Ricci curvature, and we'll discuss it. So these are basically going to be ways of sort of saying what Ricci, lower Ricci curvature bounds on a manifold are without ever computing Ricci curvature. Um, but what you really, I mean, what I really want to discuss and get to is how to do this for bounded Ricci curvature. This, this has been much less clear um, until more recently. So, so the place to start maybe is just, just to discuss lower Ricci curvature for a second. So if you have a Riemannian manifold with lower Ricci curvature, there are many, many wonderful estimates you can prove. So, so estimates on harmonic functions, estimates on things that solve the heat equation, estimates on the heat kernel and its behavior and its Gaussian looking and blah, 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 blah. Um, the Shane uh, the Yale Red Book's a good source for this. Um, but sometime in the mid-80s, uh, there's this results by, by Bakri and Emery and also uh, Emery and Lido that basically took this one step further and said that if you say this carefully and you say this precisely, then not only does a lower bound on Ricci curvature give sort of estimates for things like heat flow on the manifold. So, so H sub T, oh good, I have it written. H sub T is the heat flow here. But in fact, it's equivalent to these bounds. 
So that is to say, just sort of imagine what's happening here in number two. So in number two, so imagine it's not a negative Ricci, so I can drop all my K exploits around here. What it's saying is that uh, I can take a, a function, I can float by the heat flow, and then I can look at its gradient at a point, or I can take the function, look at its gradient, and then flow that, and well, they don't commute, but they do up to sign. In particular, if I start with a function who, who say Lipschitz uh, norm is bounded by one, it will remain bounded by one for all time. So it preserves gradient bounds and when you flow it. And this isn't just some sort of random thing. The point is that if you had a Riemannian manifold which does this, it must have non-negative Ricci curvature. So, so you're able to pull out the Ricci from this. <clears throat> um, other fun ways, I mean, there are many, many ways of characterizing lower Ricci curvature, but two more that are particularly relevant to the talk and also kind of fun is that, I mean, another sort of very distinct way of kind of doing it is that, so let's look at what's called the, the heat kernel Laplacian. So take a Riemannian manifold, pick a point in a time, then we have a natural measure on the manifold, just the heat kernel measure on this thing. So what you can do is look at the Laplacian with respect to that. So that is to say that you want to look at the divergence of the gradient, but you're taking the divergence with respect to the heat kernel measure, and you know, in coordinates it looks like that. I mean, that's what the heat kernel Laplacian looks like. And the thing is that if you have a lower bound on the, yeah? Still have a base point from which you're taking the heat kernel? Yeah, uh, there, there, there's a base point and a base time. Oh, the way oh, this is, oh, is right. Because you just did, you, the base point got lost at the top line. I, think. I mean, now you, you have a pair manifold metric. No, 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 oh, yeah, 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 no. But you can use for any point as the point. I don't want a base point. I want to say this for every point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for every point and every time, we we look at the small class. X in the denominator in the subscript is little x. Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, yeah. so you look at this heat kernel Laplacian, and the thing is that it turns out that it has a spectral gap. Um, and this spectral gap, in fact, exists if and only if you have a lower bound on Ricci curvature. Notice this doesn't matter if the manifold itself is compact or not. Right? This operator is, in many ways, much better behaved than Laplacian from this point of view. Um, and equivalently, if you have a lower Ricci bound, if and only if you have a log sobel infinite quality for, for, for this, this, this Laplacian. So these are nice ways of sort of analytically understanding what it means to have lower Ricci curvature. <clears throat> One way of saying all of this, the easiest way of summing it up, is that a manifold has lower Ricci curvature if and only if the analysis on the manifold M is well, is well controlled. Right? And precisely it means these things. Okay, so my motivation here was that I wanted a version of this for bounded Ricci curvature, where we had both an upper and a lower bound. Actually, in the beginning, I really just wanted any estimate for bounded Ricci curvature. Um, basically, all estimates for bounded Ricci curvature are the following form. They're epsilon regularity theorems, like we discussed before. So that's it. That's all people know are epsilon regularity theorems. So if you want to prove something about a space with bounded Ricci curvature, you use lower Ricci, lower Ricci, lower Ricci, lower Ricci, and in the very last line, you apply an epsilon regularity theorem. But that's how it goes every time. So there's nothing fundamentally bounded Ricci in that this was kind of aggregated. So I wanted such an estimate, and if I was really lucky, I wanted it to be equivalent to bounded Ricci curvature. And in fact, there is such an estimate, but I think the reason it was missed for a while is that to do it requires doing an analysis on the path space of the manifold, not on the manifold itself. <clears throat> so although this feels a little strange, it turns out to be very natural. So in particular, there's going to end up being what I'll write down later, a one-to-one -one correspondence between these bakker emery estimates and estimates on path space. And it'll turn out that when we apply, look at these estimates on path space and basically apply them to the simplest functions on path space. So what do I mean by simplest function? Uh, let, let a function act, uh, you take a function on path space, which acts on a curve, and just looks at u of gamma of t. So u is a fixed function on m and t is a fixed time. So this, this gives us a function on path space. And when we apply our, our, the estimates to that function there, the simplest possible function, we actually completely recover back to it, it just says back to in that context. So it is a natural generalization of Bakri and the path space which actually gives the upper bound of the Ricci curvature. And so really one way of saying this then is that bounded Ricci curvature if and only if analysis on the path space of the manifold in comparison to lower Ricci curvature if and only if analysis on the manifold. Okay, so I want to at least get to the point where I state for you what one of these estimates looks like. And this means that I mean, I've got a crash course on a few things so we're going to have to do this more quickly than I normally do because I've got 10 minutes. So first off, what do I mean by path space? I mean the continuous, uh, the continuous mapping from 0 to infinity to m. Continuous, not smooth, not based. I mean continuous. Based is a piece of x if you want. Um, <clears throat> path space comes naturally equipped with really a, a great piece of structure. 
So that is the first thing you get from path space or evaluation maps. That is, take a partition, so just a sequence of times, T1 through Tk, and associated to that, we have a map it from path space to end of the k that just takes the curve and evaluates it at those k times. Simple. And what's particularly relevant here is the fact that this leads to letting one actually build a measure on path space. And this measure is defined by its push forwards under these evaluation maps. And you don't need to have a complete fuel for what the formula down there says, but let me just tell you what it says intuitively. So to get this measure, you get one measure for every point x in the manifold. And what it does is, so notice these, these push forwards always start with a key kernel based at x. So there's this measure uh, up on path space. It contains in all the information about the key kernel centered at, at x on m for all times. But not just that, it contains in all the information about how this key kernel is interacting with every other key kernel on the manifold. You view this thing as the ultimate key kernel. I mean, it's got all the information of the key kernel at that point, how it's interacting with other key kernels, and it's packaged in this really wonderful form of being a measure uh, on path space. <clears throat> so in particular, it gives us a way of integrating. So for every point in M, we get a measure on, on path space which we can integrate with respect to. This is our first piece of structure. And the second piece of structure, and this is classy, by the way, the Wiener measure. This is a very old thing. Um, the second piece of structure is, is new. So, so that is, we need a notion of gradient. And there are notions of gradient on path space. Um, but the, this, this, the, the most natural, uh, the, the one that turns out to play the a role in this context is the parallel gradient. So how do you take gradients? You take directional derivatives and directions, right? And you superorder these things. This is how you get norms of gradients. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix a curve. We're going to look at all parallel translation and variant vector fields along it. And we're going to soup overall uh, over the directional derivative uh, of our function in all parallel translation and variant directions. Notice this is a finite dimensional gradient. It sees only a finite dimensional amount of information. So the way you sort of recover the infinite dimensions, actually, is you have one parameter family of such things. So instead of a, a gradient that sees an infinite dimensional amount of information, it is more natural and better to have a gradient that actually sees uh, one parameter family of gradients that all see a finite dimensional amount of information. So namely, for every t, uh, we, we look at the t parallel gradient, which just soups over uh, directional derivatives uh, around vector fields, which are 0 up to time t, and then parallel translation variant after. So it's sort of like saying it's the parallel gradient after time t. Okay, so that being said, I mean, this is going a little quick, but that's okay. How do we actually get to our first characterization? So let's just sort of play with the following. Take a function on path space. Right? And let's take from this function on path space, let's induce from it a function on the manifold. So, so how do we do this? Just take f and what we can, and now for every point x in the manifold, we have a measure. So the natural thing to do is to it. So, so we get a function on m, simply by, by for every point x, taking the Wiener measure, uh, gamma sub x, and, and integrate f with respect to this. Fine. And one thing to note is that if f is continuous as a function on path space, then, then this function is continuous on m. And this is basically just the statement that these measures upstairs are varying uh, continuously in the weak topology. It's not so hard to prove. But once you have this, so you have continuous, it's natural to ask other things. Is this function on m induced from this? Is it differentiable? Does it have two derivatives? Are these derivatives bounded? More generally, what about gradient bounds? I mean, is the gradient bounded? And if it is, do gradient bounds on f give rise to gradient bounds on the induced function on m? And the, the main point is, of course, we've got to be really precise about what we mean by all this. But let's, for example, look at this. So is it the case that the, that the norm, the gradient of the induced function on m is less than or equal to the induced function on m from, from the zero parallel gradient of f, just as a question? And it turns out, it's if and only if you're reaching flat. So, I mean, if you're a Taylor manifold, you're a the out if and only if this estimate holds upstairs. <clears throat> uh, there are versions of this for bounded Ricci instead, and for metric measure spaces, in fact, and in dimensional versions, if you're familiar with this sort of thing. So, I mean, this, this is the simplest version of it, but it's sort of the easiest to look at. So, maybe in my last two minutes, so this is the first character. There's actually three characterizations which I, I really won't get into. But what, what I'll basically say is the following, I'll just sort of throw it at you without really doing it carefully. But imagine we were to take the simplest function just to, uh, to plug this into. So, to, so take a function f on path space, which lo looks like u of gamma of t. So, u is a function on the manifold, and t is a fixed time. Then, if you just compute out what all this is, well, what you actually arrive to at the very end is exactly the back memory estimate we stated, uh, that, that number two. So it exactly recovers Bakri when we apply it to the, the simplest function that's on path space. Um, ah, okay. So 
what I'll maybe say in 45 seconds or less, and you know, it's not so necessary to, to, to follow this, is that the other two characterizations, one of which is about looking at martingales on path space. If you don't know what this is, don't worry about it, but basically the idea is that the derivative, the quadratic variation of a martingale, turns out to have a bound, if and only if you have a bound on the curvature. And similarly, if you look at the Orsi Ulenbeck operator on the manifold, then this is like an infinite dimensional Laplacian, and this has a spectral gap uh, over log Sobolev, if and only if you have a bound on the Ricci curvature. Um, these sort of spectral gaps and log Sobolev were sort of understood, I mean, a weaker version of this implication was kind of understood before, and this goes back to Fang and Sue, and it was for me a big motivation why I started looking at this in the first place. Okay, so that's it. Any questions? Actually, you have five more, five more minutes. Oh, she was flashing one minute at me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm done now. <laughs> okay, if not, let's thank Aaron again. The ICM organizers have a small gift for Aaron.